What exactly is Canadian culture? That's a fully loaded question. Hey there, we're here in Duncan, BC, also referred to as the City of Totems. Canadian culture is so diverse, and diversity is part of the vibrancy of Canada, and we're going to celebrate that. The carving of a totem pole can be a deeply spiritual experience that begins with the choosing of the tree that will be carved. But as our next feature by Nancy Wilmot in Port Alberni tells us, sometimes it's the tree that chooses the carver. Eight hundred years ago, when that tree was just a bud, our Creator knew what was going to happen to that tree, who was going to be around when it was time to carve it. And the people that is working on the pole now were selected. It was preordained before contact even. Preordained, chosen, selected by the Creator. Powerful words to describe a cedar tree, but words that capture the reverence of these West Coast artists as they carve this tree creating a totem pole that, when it's done, will symbolize the revitalization of Indigenous languages. It's not just a pole, it's a monument because we had lost everything. And the language was one of the things that we could call our own. But this pole, this cedar, had its own story to tell. A story that shaped those who worked on it, even as their hands shaped its face. Decades ago, it fell, hitting the earth so hard it was broken by the impact. It lay hidden, waiting for the day it would be revealed. And when that day came, even though four different trees had been identified as possibilities for this project, bad weather had made all but this broken tree inaccessible. Some members of the group turned away, unwilling to work on a damaged trunk, when they were reminded that this too was a gift from the Creator, a gift that carried its own story of brokenness and hope. That cedar intended for us to pull together, not only as artists, but as a community to, uh, to repair and, uh, and, and look at what people, you know, may always talk about for years to come, reconciliation. You know? It's no easy task to repair a tree or a community. And even as the pole was being strengthened, there were other challenges, financial shortfalls, personal crises. But somehow the pole kept crying out to be heard, drawing people in, insisting that what was broken needed to be mended. I had this army of conscripts working from the community and they just started to work. Yeah, that's what it ran on. It was like integrity or honor, respect. So it transformed all of us and it's transforming our community and the people of Port Alberni to look at things differently. There's still work to be done on the pole before it's fully awake but the message it's waited so long to bring is already being heard. And because so many hands have worked on it, the artist's story, a story of respect and equality and humility, has taken on an even deeper significance. We look at our 10 relatives, you know, from the sky, the, uh, the moon, the stars, the sun, you, uh, the wind, the mountain, the rivers and the lakes, the land, the sea, the 11th being the earthquake, will uh, tend to remind you and I you uh, how very, very small we are in this universe, in this world. We're taking some power back, albeit um, benign power as the world understands it, but we're making a, a statement about who we were to ourselves. You know, that cedar 
you know, has become part of what we have to repair. We're all growing together at the same rate and starting over. Despite all that we went through, the Creator is still taking care of us by the tenderness that he took with that 800-year-old tree. That totem pole is expected to be completed in the summer of 2020 and will stand in Port Alberni as a reminder that healing is possible. Sometimes as Canadians we take hockey and snow for granted, but for some it can be an exhilarating experience. In our next feature, we head to the BC Rockies where James Farnan followed a group of international students as they checked out one of our greatest national pastimes. Yeah. Every time they make it up there, but they never strike anything. I always think that they're hitting each other intentionally. <laughs> they just keep on pushing each other. Is that a goal? No, it was not a goal. No. Studying abroad is a great way to see the world and experience a different way of life. And for these students from northern India, what better place to experience Canada than in the small mountain town of Invermere, British Columbia. Where I'm from, there is no mountain at all, so I haven't seen any mountain in my life. I only saw mountain in TV. The first glimpse, just coming down the, the hill we have, it was like so good that the lake and the whole town was so adorable. Ekam Noor Singh, Himajatana and Mohit Sharma first arrived in the Columbia Valley during the fall of 2018, just in time for winter. When I searched about the town and I have seen like it gets pretty cold in winter and my teachers were saying uh, it, you're gonna see snow, you're gonna see snow in just a few days and we were thinking like they are lying to us because there were no snow. We woke up in the morning, I just opened the window curtains and I saw that it's, it's snowing out so it was all white. We just ran, literally ran out of the main door in our shots uh, to just to see the snow and feel the snow, what, what actually snow feels like. I didn't have a car and so I, I walked through on the snow to came to the college and it was quite fun because uh, the snow is goes into my shoes and my my feet got wet. Our students were out in the field dancing and they were absolutely so happy they thought it was magical. Yeah, they just changed the sides. The Rockies came to this side and they the other team just went to that side. I knew about ice hockey because I was taught in school, but I was not uh, like I didn't get a chance back in India to see ice hockey. I used to see the uh, hockey, ice hockey game on the TV. Then I I decided to watch them live. It's uh, very interesting to see how they they skate on the ice and how they play. First time I was confused at why they are like rushing so fast. <laughs> Why are they banging into each other? How do they skate and play hockey on the same time? Oh no! Yeah, it's true too. Just as the students have embraced Invermere, Invermere has embraced them. Our community has been given a gift of uh, a little bit more cultural diversity and sharing in some of their traditions. We've had over 130 uh, community members come to the Invermere campus to celebrate Diwali, which is one of their biggest uh, celebrations in the year. So it, it works both ways. Reflecting on their experience here so far, the trio says without question, They've enjoyed their time in Canada. I don't want to leave for like next maybe 10 to 15 years. I just want to stick to stick to this area. I want to stay in Invermere till my graduation and after that I, I definitely stay for, for some time. I'm learning a lot from Canada. I think that's totally life-changing moments for me. Mm. 
it just wouldn't be a show about Canadian cultures without more hockey. Stay tuned for more stick and puck and some vibrant Indian colors only on Shaw Spotlight. Are you a content creator looking to expand your audience and make your voice heard in your community? Shaw Spotlight wants to provide you with a platform to share your hobbies, interests, and stories, and all for free. Visit us to find out more. As well as being referred to as the city of totems, Duncan is also home to the largest hockey stick and puck in the world. Welcome back to our Spotlight on Canadian Cultures. Now, many of us Canucks would agree that ice hockey is much more than just a sport. It's a huge part of our heritage. Tommy Johnson in Northern Ontario shares what playing Canadian hockey is all about. Just kidding. At this point in my life, it's hockey. It's eat, sleep, breathe hockey, pretty much. I used to go to the hockey rink in my swim trunks and flip-flops every day, and now I have to, you know, wear pants and winter boots and sometimes you gotta wear two socks to make sure your toes don't freeze but it's uh, it's it's well worth it. My name is Parker James. I grew up in uh, the Huntington Beach area of California and now I'm playing in Northwestern Ontario. In my experience no matter where you are the culture is the same. If you are involved with hockey everyone loves it with the same amount of passion. Everyone that's invested in it is invested a hundred percent. Hockey culture, in my opinion, is like it's just a closer, tight-knit community. The ultimate goal is to become the best hockey player that I can be, but it's also about the journey. Now I can say I've played real Canadian hockey, and coming out on the ice every day, it's almost like an adrenaline rush. Where you get a, a bunch of different mixed feelings, excited, uh, sometimes you get a little nervous. It makes me feel like I've lived the real hockey lifestyle, you know, and, and I, uh, I love it. Moving away from home uh, is not easy. Uh, being this far away from your family and not being able to see them very often is uh, real tough. But having such a welcoming billet family, it really makes makes it much easier. Did we ever operate a snowblower? You've operated one? Really? <laughs> no? Okay, well that would be interesting. Oh boy. Is it like a lawnmower? A little sure. bit. <laughs> It's great to be involved in a part of this hockey culture and um, to kind of experience it with him because um, it's so new for him as well. Like, I mean, he d he's never really seen snow or had to shovel or uh, wear layers, right? So it's kind of neat for us to be able to go along with his uh, experience with this coming from so far. Uh, no matter, you know, if you're from California or Northwestern Ontario, you know, it's, it's hard to describe, but everybody in that culture is, is going to be able to uh, gel well together. If you play hockey, you have to visit Northern Canada and any province just to experience uh, the different lifestyle it is to play hockey. For whatever reason, I've always come back to hockey. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the competitiveness of it that you just can't find in any other sport. Uh, but whatever that is, it's just it's hockey's the best sport I believe in the world, and that's why I chose it. Hockey will always be a part of my life. It's it's given me so many great opportunities, and it's it's given so much to me in my life that I will be forever grateful. I I can't imagine myself without it. Many people come to Canada to start a new life, bringing their traditions with them. But it's often difficult to get things from back home here to Canada. Luckily, there's people like Perva who are looking to change that. Matt Lorenz in Fort McMurray was lucky enough to share her story. It was my dream. Uh, I'll do something one day to bring things from India in Canada. And now I'm doing it and fulfilling my dream here. My suppliers, yeah. they really make it tough to open the boxes. 
when a bride come to me and they ask me to get a something for them from India, it is really difficult because I have to contact uh, with Indian suppliers and I have to find the things there. Um, some of my parents and some other people they are helping me in India and they have to go to the shops and take pictures and then send it to me and then I have to select the things which is good for my bride. So yeah, it is really difficult to get the things uh, from them to here. Hey, hi Shivam, how are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, actually, I uh, received a parcel today and the uh, dress ka color change. Hai. So, can you please send me another one? Okay, thank you. Yeah. I still remember the day when we first met. I was uh, I was like just panicking at that time because I was new year here and I don't have anything to wear like traditional. So I just come over here and she finds something and she fix it up for me. And that's like, <laughs> that was my happy time at that time. Yeah. It is really important for me. And I feel really glad when I find a perfect thing for a bride uh, because I feel that I am finding that thing for myself on my wedding day. Yeah, see, the colors are real beautiful. Yeah. 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 It's too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk about Indian wedding, there are so many attires according to the region because India has, I think, 36 states. Yeah, and each and every state, they have their own attire. So if we talk about the attire and the Indian weddings, it will take whole day about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is a sari and it is six meter long saris. Eastern part of India, north part of India, and west part of India, brides usually wear on their wedding days. And usually, these are so heavy also. When bride comes to me, I have to know about all her history, from which region she belongs, from which religion she belongs because in Hindu weddings they have different type of um, colors and combination and uh, in a Punjabi wedding or Sikh wedding they have different type of culture and uh, themes. These are Punjabi bangles and these calls Shura. These bangles are related with the good health of her husband. Punjabi bride has to wear these bangles for when in the half year and yeah it is difficult to wear <laughs> yeah. for whole night, whole day, sleeping time, yeah, and you cannot remove for bath and sleeping time, no, you have to wear it. It means everything, it means a lot because uh, over here I miss all my traditional stuff and everything, so when she get the stuff, it's like emotional, I get like, I can still feel my roots over here, so I can feel my India over here, you can see that, yeah. Music and food are two main components of culture, so we have some warm beats and traditional eats coming up on Shaw Spotlight. Are you a content creator looking to expand your audience and make your voice heard in your community? Shaw Spotlight wants to provide you with a platform to share your hobbies, interests, and stories, and all for free. Visit us to find out more. Many would say that music is integral to culture, and musical instruments are a huge part of what makes music cultural. So for example, sitar music sounds Indian, koto music Japanese, and there's no mistake in the warm Caribbean beats of a steel pan. Jonathan Horace met up with a member of a steel pan band in Winnipeg, and for Kayleen, this music is her way to connect with her family's culture. The tone, the uniqueness of it, the pulsating beat of that instrument is what I really love. I would say the rhythm that comes from it, you know, the rhythm and the sound is a different kind of song, you know. It, it, if you listen to it, it makes you feel happy. It, it, it has that kind of effect. You have no option but to tap your feet. Like, the cool thing about it is that's such a unique instrument. It's not very known here. Wow. 
My name is Kayleen Blackwood. I play in the High Life Steel Orchestra and I have now become the arranger. Okay, what are you, what you going to play? I'm going to play Paganini. Okay. Only half of it though. Okay. <laughs> so we used to go to All Saints Church and me and my sister were like, we were both like six and a half, almost seven. We were both very young and um, we were just traveling around the church or just walking around playing games, doing whatever kids do, right? And our grandma was there and she all of a sudden calls us and we go down, she says, come downstairs. So we go downstairs and then we see, we see the pants there. And obviously she knows about the pants. She's from Trinidad herself. And she's, and she kind of did, you know, the grandma thing where she's like, here, you guys are gonna go do this now. Yeah, it's kind of how we started. <laughs> We've been kind of shoved in there and now we're just kind of staying, we stayed in there. As a child, I was not allowed to play the steel drum, but I loved the music. And so I decided whenever I have my family, I am going to get them involved with that wonderful instrument. When I um, decided, my mom said, well, Ali, what would you like to play? Because everybody was playing something. And I said, the steel pan. I, I thought she got a heart attack. She said, what? Over my dead body. So I said, well, that is it for pan playing. Well, let's get the pans out so you can. My father's belief, you know, as to where the instruments belong. He felt that that instrument belonged to the lower class, like, you know, three classes basically on the island, higher, the middle, and the lower. And the lower were those boys who were on the streets, they were unemployed and so on. And those are the people that began this instrument. So we're going to kick things off uh, with a short performance from the High Life Steel Orchestra. I think Pan was definitely one way that made me get out of my shell, especially because I, have a very, I was, used to be a very shy kid. Very, very proud of her. Very proud. And like she has a basic a gift for this thing, you know. Well, if, if you notice, a lot of these kids are, are in the band are young kids. They were born in Canada, right? They, didn't, they weren't born in Trinidad. Because I haven't been to Trinidad before, right? So it's definitely being able to connect with my culture, for sure. It's definitely really something that's close. Oh, really, every time they play, I feel this sense of pride and, yes, achievement. Yes, they're doing it. I couldn't do it. I was not allowed to do it, but they can do it. And that's a nice feeling. lucky that here in Canada we're free to express our culture how we see fit. But for the Indigenous peoples of our country, they weren't always allowed to honour their traditions and values. Let's head to Victoria where Ryan Spedding learned how two women are keeping one tasty tradition alive. Something that my uncle John Elliot Stalkwith once said to me and to a group of youth was that we needed to practice our Kwisantich ways of being. And if we stopped practicing our Kwisantich ways of being, we would no longer be Kwisantich people. The way that we connect to land, the way that we connect to our foods, the way that our teachings are wrapped into all of those things, that's what makes us Kwisantich people. That's where my identity is, and um, it's important for my sense of belonging, and also for my children's sense of belonging in this world. A pit cook is a traditional method of cooking food underground. One of the traditional ways of cooking kwa'lao, camas. Our traditional starch in the territory, so camas is a bulb of a flowering plant. Camas is very unique in how it's pit cooked. Dug a certain way to prepare, uh, contain the heat and to slow cook the camas. They're really here today because of our ancestors and how they managed what you now know as the Gary Oak ecosystem, the Kwatlao food system. 
Typically you would harvest greenery the day before you would have a pit cook. In our territories we use salal, fern, and different types of algae. You'd place the rocks in the hole in the ground, you build the fire on top, shovel out um, any remaining wood after a few hours. Do you end up having a layer of hot rocks, greenery, wrapped food, another layer of greenery, canvas, and then you pour soil on top. Kind of like the lid, keeps the, the heat all in and it just slowly cooks over 24 hours to 48 hours is a traditional way of cooking kwatlao. Fruits of our labor. Cheryl has really inspired me to want to learn more about camas. It was something that wasn't familiar to me. She's somebody who's advocated for it for years. I knew eventually I would have the opportunity to do a pit cook and um, luckily um, Cheryl was the person who was able to, to show me how to do it. We have a responsibility and a role too and we connect so much so to this and very important land and food system. And I think creating that awareness is so important. That's one of the things that I really like to encourage uh, Bianca to continue to do. I could see the passion in her and I could see um, her connecting well with the land and I could just see her really doing well harvesting and pit cooking and creating awareness. We have a word in our language, it's called chilang, and the direct translation is inherent birthrights. So for me, I have a birthright to know these things. It reminds me of the stewardship that women in Kusetnich in the Kwangan territories had in relationship to Klao Kamis. All plants share stories and they tell a history and so it's a reminder to me of um, where I come from, who I am. It's important that I pass those things on to my daughter and to my children and that we keep those things alive. And I think it's important to practice those things in my life, um, not just because um, I would have to for a job, but because I want to live it. We've only scratched the surface when it comes to explaining exactly what Canadian culture is. There's just so much. We're just too diverse of a country, and it's an amazing thing. However, we hope you enjoyed what we did get to celebrate today. To see some extra behind the scenes content from this episode, please visit our YouTube channel. And to learn more about Spotlight, join us online at shopspotlight.ca. And please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. From the City of Totems, I'm Sarah Smith. Thanks for celebrating our great Canadian culture.